Welcome back to the Amino Acid Catabolism Playlist. The objectives of this video are number one going to be to understand a concept called energy charge. This is not ordinarily a topic that's taught in your biochemistry course. Um, it's something that my professor at um, University of Texas at Tyler named Dr. Sean Black came up with. Um, and it's not something you'll find in textbooks, but it's something that's really important for understanding the allosteric effects of some of the allosteric enzymes in amino acid catabolism. And those enzymes are going to be glutamate dehydrogenase and glutaminase. There also is an enzyme called glutamine synthetase, but we're going to come back to that enzyme in amino acid biosynthesis. We're also going to try to understand the allosteric regulation of these enzymes during the fasting and fed states. And as we'll find, energy charge plays a big role in that as well. Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. Okay. This is a picture, a handy picture that was provided in my Biochemistry 2 class by Dr. Sean Black of the University of Texas at Tyler. So I just wanted to give him credit for this picture. Um, he's the one that created it. And what this picture does is it's going to give us a, a little bit of knowledge about what happens during different energy charges in the cell. Well, what is energy charge? Well, to understand what energy charge is, we need to understand which molecules might be associated with low energy charge and which ones might be associated with high energy charge. Okay. And so if we have, if we're talking about molecules that have high energy charge, what we're talking about are things like ATP, things like ATP, things like GTP. And in general, we're talking about our nucleoside triphosphates. And specifically, the tri is important because as we'll find, adenosine diphosphate and adenosine monophosphate, those uh, molecules do not fall into these because they are not nucleoside triphosphates. Other things that might be associated with high energy charge would be things like NADH. And sometimes they'll even consider acetyl-CoA. Okay? So these are molecules that are going to be associated with high en energy charge. Okay? Now what are things that would be associated with low energy charge? Well, those are going to be basically the opposites of those molecules. right? So those would be things like NAD+. Right? Things like adenosine diphosphate, adenosine monophosphate, and in general, you have your nucleoside uh, di or monophosphates, right? And then also sometimes coenzyme A, okay? So that would be something that's associated with, oops, there's my mouse, coenzyme A. Okay, so these things would be associated with low energy charge. But what does that mean? Well, let's think about it in terms of the fasting and fed state. Okay, so let's say we're in the fed state. We just ate a meal, right? So let's say we, we just opened up a bag of sweet potato fries, cooked them in the oven, and, and ate them, right? Well, initially, right after the meal, we're going to have plenty of NADH, right? We're going to have plenty of ATP... GTP acetyl CoA. Well, how does that happen? Well, number one, especially if you're eating something like potatoes, right? That's filled with glucose, right? So we're going to be running glycolysis, right? And of course, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase gives us NADH. And then at the end, we're going to get pyruvate, and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex will give us acetyl CoA. And then that'll go into the TCA cycle where we get three more NADHs, right? And and we also get FADH2, and all four of those molecules fuel the respiratory chain, right? And not only do we get an ATP slash GTP out of, su out of succinyl CoA synthetase, but we're also fueling the respiratory chain. So we power ATP synthase. So we're going to get lots of ATP during the fed state. And I hope that makes sense. So all four, well, not really four, but in general, these molecules that I've written on the right here during high energy charge, those things will be associated with the fed state. And so in the fed state, we, we are in a condition known as high energy charge. Okay, well, let's think about the fasting state. Well, in the fasting state, we'll, we're going to assume that we've been um, 
we've been burning the ATPs, right? We're contracting our muscles. Recall that myosin, the protein in muscle that's responsible for muscle contraction, for every contraction it does, for every power stroke, it burns an ATP. Plus, on top of that, we're using neurons, right? We're firing neurons. And to replenish the neuron um, concentration of sodium potassium on the right side of the axon, we're using sodium potassium ATPases. So there's lots of processes by which we're burning ATP, and at the same time, we're burning our NADHs by NADH dehydrogenase. And, and so, you know, we're wasting our acetyl-CoA inside the TCA cycle. So all of these low energy charge molecules tend to build up, and those are the ones I have written here. They're NAD, and then we also have our nucleoside diphosphates, nucleoside monophosphates, and so forth. And then we can sometimes also consider coenzyme A. So these molecules would be associated with the fasting state. Now, let's think about also let's think about the fasting state, right? That's what we'll consider first, because those are the conditions under which we're going to run amino acid catabolism or amino acid degradation. So let's think about that. Let's think about our blood glucose level. During the fasting state, we're assuming that we haven't had a good meal in a while, right? So our blood glucose levels are going to drop, right? So there's going to become less and less ability to run purely on glycolysis, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over our metabolism to a higher percentage of beta oxidation and amino acid catabolism just because there's lower blood glucose so there's less ability to run on the glucose right because we haven't had a meal now this particular video and this particular picture is focusing on two amino acids those are glutamine and glutamate okay and what I want to, or, and in, a sep, in separate videos, we're going to go over the mechanisms of glutamine synthetase, glutaminase, and glutamate dehydrogenase. And specifically in the catabolic direction, what I want you to understand is we're running from the direction of glutamine, shown on the right, and we're going towards the direction of alpha ketoglutarate. And to understand why that is, let's think about the low energy charge, right? We have these low energy molecules, NAD, ADP, AMP, right? They're low energy. And so you can imagine that if we have low energy and low ATP and low NADH, we're going to want to make more of those, right? Because we're assuming that NADH, ATP, and so forth, those are low, right? So we're going to want to make more of those. So we're going to run first from the direction of glutamine to glutamate. And the enzyme that accomplishes this is glutaminase. Okay, And glutaminase is an allosteric enzyme. And it actually is stimulated by adenosine diphosphate allosterically. And I think that that makes sense. right? That makes sense because because ADP is associated with low energy charge. So if you need to make more energy by going towards alpha ketoglutarate, it would make sense that a low energy charge molecule would turn on glutaminase allosterically, right? And it turns out that adenosine diphosphate is an allosteric stimulator of glutaminase. And glutaminase is a hydrolase enzyme, and it's going to convert glutamine into glutamate. Okay. Now, glutamate dehydrogenase, which is the next enzyme, is also an allosteric enzyme, and it's a reversible enzyme, but we're only going to focus on the direction in which it runs from glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, one thing before we go into this reaction that I want you to see is when we're talking about alpha-ketoglutarate, recall that alpha-ketoglutarate can be shunted into the TCA cycle, right? And in the TCA cycle, it's going to ultimately get consumed by the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex in which we form NADH. And then that's going to form succinyl-CoA, and we're going to continue that molecule on throughout the TCA cycle, and we're going to pick up, at least till the end of the cycle, one FADH2, one GTP slash ATP, and one NADH. So ultimately, if we're going to the left on this graph, if we're going to the left towards alpha-ketoglutarate, 
what we're doing is we're making more energy. And I hope that makes sense. We need more energy because we're in low energy charge. We have lots of NAD present. We have lots of ADP, AMP, and so forth. But we have low NADH and low ATP. And remember that ATP is necessary for life. If you were to run out of ATP, you die. And that's really because muscles need ATP to contract and neurons need ATP to fire. Okay, so if we're going to the left, that means we're generating more energy. And so the way we do it, at least through these two amino acids, is by converting them ultimately to alpha ketoglutarate and, and shunting that into the TCA cycle. Now, glutamate dehydrogenase is technically a reversible enzyme. Technically, it's reversible. But at least in mammals, only one of the directions is really observed. And that's the direction going from glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate. And to understand this, especially during times of catabolism, we need to understand that, remember that glutaminase is stimulated by high levels of adenosine diphosphate. So we have to remember that glutaminase would be constantly turning glutamine into glutamate. And so by Le Chatelier's principle, glutamate dehydrogenase is going to be shifted towards the production of alpha-ketoglutarate and ammonia. Okay, so glutamate will go from the direction of glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate. So the reverse reaction going from alpha-ketoglutarate to glutamate is not really observed. And especially during times of amino acid catabolism, it is certainly not observed. And glutamate dehydrogenase is also an allosteric enzyme. It's stimulated by high levels of ADP. And that makes sense because we're, if we're in low energy charge states, we want to make more energy. And one of the ways we make more energy is by running this reaction to produce alpha-ketoglutarate, which goes into the TCA cycle to produce more energy. And it would also make sense that this enzyme is inhibited by high levels of GTP. So if we have high energy charge, GTP tends to inhibit this enzyme. And that makes sense. And that also brings into light why the reverse reaction is not really observed. So let's say we're in high energy charge. So we have high levels of NADH and high levels of ATP and GTP and so forth, right? So we have high levels of those. Well, why wouldn't the reverse reaction of going from alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate occur? Well, if we have high levels of GTP, this enzyme should be allosterically turned off, right? We're either going to be in low energy charge or we're going to be in high energy charge. So if this enzyme is turned off, even if we have lots of alpha ketoglutarate present, it's not going to reverse itself. So when GTP is present in high amounts, or we can say high energy charge is present, this reaction will not simply just reverse itself. It's going to be allosterically turned off. But when we're in low energy charge and we have high ADP present, this enzyme will go from the direction of glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate, partly because we're building up glutamate from glutaminase. And by Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to force the reaction to produce alpha ketoglutarate. Now one thing I want to point your attention to in this reaction sequence of going from glutamine to alpha ketoglutarate is in both of these reactions we're producing ammonia. Okay, And remember how what we talked about in the urea cycle video that high levels of ammonia are not good. They're toxic especially for brain cells. So remember that that ammonia will be activated by carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1 and then that carbamoyl phosphate will be shunted into the urea cycle and the ammonia will ultimately ultimately be excreted in the form of urea so when we're catabolizing a lot of amino acids especially these we are producing ammonia and it will eventually be excreted as urea so i hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on energy charge in the cell remember that when we're in high energy charge that's going to basically favor biosynthesis and we're not going to talk about biosynthesis here we'll come back to that in the biosynthesis playlist and we'll actually use this exact same picture but we're talking about catabolism and in the direction of catabolism that's going to be favored when we're in low energy charge we have low energy molecules we need to make higher energy molecules so we're going to favor the direction that goes from glutamine to glutamate and then from glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate and make sure you understand the allosteric regulation of these enzymes. See you in the next video.